Hey, everyone, and welcome back. Today, I've got John Bowens on the show. John's one of the most sought after and respected educators in the self-directed IRA industry. Uh, I, if anybody knows me, you know I'm a huge fan of using your self-directed IRA. Very excited to jump in with him today. He's the Director and Head of Education and Investor Success at Equity Trust Company. John draws from his 20 years in the real estate industry and his experience as an active real estate investor. He has traveled all over the United States, virtually and in person. He's trained over 60,000 investors during more than 400 workshops and classes, and he spread the message about the power of building tax-free wealth and leaving a lasting legacy. John, it's great to have you on the show today, man. It's good to see you. Yeah, likewise, Brandon. Glad to be here and excited to share with your audience a little bit about self-directed IRAs and how to invest in various private market assets, specifically real estate, which, as you mentioned in my introduction there, uh, that is my background. And I work with a lot of real estate investors, a lot of entrepreneurs, business owners, folks that just want to diversify their retirement funds into a alternative asset class beyond the traditional stock market. I want to get more into that. There's a whole world here that a lot of people don't know exists because people are used to basically just dumping their money in the stock market or giving it to a financial advisor. And this is a really great vehicle that very few people know about, and it comes with a ton of tax advantages. Before we jump into that, give us a little bit more on your background. You've got this, this fantastic background. How did you get into this? Yeah, I stumbled into this, Brandon. Uh, you know, 15 years ago, I was heading down the path of becoming a financial advisor, financial planner, and operate in the traditional markets. You know, that is stocks, fixed income, and advise people on those types of ways to invest. And 15 years ago, I was introduced to our company founder, Dick Desich, who's widely known as the pioneer of the self directed IRA industry. And prior to that, I was working for a real estate company. And prior to that, I was studying finance in business school. And everything I learned about was the traditional stock market. And I remember asking the owners of the real estate company I was working for, and they owned a lot of commercial property and some residential property. And that's really how I got curious about real estate investing, because I saw there was a, big, a, a large opportunity uh, in, in creating wealth in real estate. And so I asked the owners of this company I was working for, I said, you know, do, it seems like you guys don't have IRAs or 401ks. You never talk about that. And they said, no, we don't believe in IRAs or 401ks or those types of retirement plans. I said, well, why don't you believe in that? And they said, well, we don't believe in the stock market. <laughs> and I said, well, that's interesting. Now, they, they had made all of their money and they had created all their family wealth through real estate. And so that made sense to me that the reason why they don't want to use their IRA or 401k is because the only options that IRAs and 401ks have, at least at that time in my mind, was the stock market. Mm -hmm. And then 15 years ago, I met our company founder, Dick Desich, and he taught me about how you could buy a single family rental property in your IRA. And the industry calls it a self-directed IRA. And that's just an in industry term. It just indicates to you that you can invest in real estate and private equity and gold and silver and cryptocurrency and all these unique types of alternative assets. So, you know, my mind was expanded 15 years ago and I jumped aboard here at Equity and I've been here ever since. I've been self directing my own accounts. I've learned from thousands of investors across the country. Uh, I've been able to assist thousands of investors invest in various types of alternative assets, not as an advisor not as someone that's telling them where to invest, but uh, ultimately, how do you do this with a self-directed IRA? What does that look like? From real estate joint ventures to very simple, just a single family rental property in a self-directed IRA to private money loans. Uh, I've, I've been able to work with customers all across the country and process thousands of these various real estate and other alternative investment transactions. You know, I remember when I first discovered the self-directed IRAs, I'm a big fan of investing things that I can control and you can't control a stock, right? You can't control a competitor that comes out, some new tech company that comes over and takes over MySpace and, you know, boom, yeah, Facebook. I mean, the industry is changing so much with these tech stocks. There's just, a, you, and you can't control that. When I found out that I could actually use my retirement funds to invest in things that I could have a little bit more control over, aka some of my real estate investments, completely changed my world. What now 
walk through some of the steps here on exactly what a self-directed, you know, IRA is and how is it different than your traditional, you know, account, your traditional 401k accounts, your traditional IRA accounts? Yeah. So best way to think of it is an IRA, 401k, simple IRA, SEP IRA, uh, solo 401k. These are all just different types of retirement accounts. And most financial institutions that will be a custodian, we refer to it as a custodian. Most financial institutions that are going to be a custodian for those types of accounts, they're only going to permit you to invest in traditional stock market-based investments. So stocks, individual stocks, ETFs, mutual funds, uh, bond funds, maybe some individual bonds. But relatively speaking, you're only going to be able to participate in the traditional, call it 60-40 model, which you'll hear a lot. 60% public equities, 40% fixed income. Mm -hmm. And some people, when they're working with a financial advisor, financial planner, that financial advisor, financial planner, the only investments that they can sell them are traditional stock market related type investments. Um, that's not a bad thing, not disparaging financial advisors or financial planners here. It's just that's what their core competency is. But a lot of our customers and a lot of investors that come to equity trust in this self-directed IRA environment, they want to invest beyond the stock market. Some mm -hmm. people want to allocate 100% of their portfolio into alternative investments because they don't believe in the stock market at all. So like the founders of the company that I worked for years ago that I mentioned, they didn't believe in the stock market. So they put all their money into real estate. And if somebody on this call wants to do that, uh, that's entirely up to them. They get to choose their own destiny as far as diversification. Diversification is in the eyes of the investor. That's that's what we've always said here. And, and that's what I believe. And uh, that doesn't mean that you don't work with other people like a financial advisor or a CPA. We encourage folks to work with those other members that are financial team, but the investor gets the opportunity to choose what their diversification strategy is. Yeah. And then for some people, they want to diversify maybe 20, 30, 40% of their portfolio into real estate and alternatives. They have the option to do that. So equity trust and the self-directed IRA really becomes another tool in their toolbox to be able to utilize and deploy their retirement capital into the investments that make the most sense for them. And I think it is really important, Brandon, to emphasize that self-directed is just an industry term. So if you go to the IRS website, irs.gov, you can actually see where it says that real estate is a permissible investment, but due to the administrative burden, most financial institutions don't allow you to hold real estate in an account. So it's it's a matter it's not a matter of legality but rather a matter of choice. And so the first step of the process for an investor is to move their retirement money from the existing account to an equity trust self-directed account. Now in moving that money, it's really important for people to know that they're not being taxed or penalized. One of the first questions I get from investors is if I move my money into a self-directed IRA, are there going to be some sort of adverse tax consequences or penalties? And the answer is absolutely not. So as long as you follow the rules and the right guidelines. And then furthermore, when you buy a property, there's no taxes or penalties. So as long as you're following the right process. Uh, for example, Brandon, I had a client here in Ohio where my home base is, and that's where our company headquarters is right outside of Cleveland. He bought a, a property at a foreclosure auction a few years ago for $68,000. So his Roth IRA bought the property for $68,000. His Roth IRA took title. He put $20,000 worth of work into the property. So he was in it for about $88,000. His Roth IRA paid for those expenses. Mm -hmm. And there was no taxes or penalties to buy the property, pay for the expenses. He wasn't borrowing against the account. The IRA actually owned the property. The mm -hmm. IRA was on deed to the property, on title. And now he's renting that property out. It's a two unit. So there's 900 coming in on unit A and 950 on unit B. So he has 1,850 in rental income, gross rental income coming in on a monthly basis. His net operating income is about $1,400 on a monthly basis. And there's no debt on this property. So we have no mortgage servicing or loan servicing on this particular asset. He's generating all of that 1,400 on a monthly basis net tax-free in his Roth IRA. He'll never pay another dime of tax. And he's actually over the qualified retirement age of 59 and a half. So in theory, every month, he could take a distribution from that Roth of 1400 and pay 0% tax. And the property has an appraised value right now at about 140000 So if he sells the property 
and recognizes about a $40,000 capital gain, that capital gain is also tax-free in the Roth IRA. So the Roth IRA and just IRA in, IRAs in general have a tax-exempt status, particularly a Roth IRA is tax-free. So in the example, all of his profits going forward are tax-free. There's no Schedule E. There's no reporting of any capital gains. It's all tax-free in the Roth IRA. And if he leaves that to his children or grandchildren, they'll inherit the account tax-free. And 15 years ago, when I learned about this, so when Mr. Desich, the pioneer of the self-directed IRA industry, took me under his wing and became my mentor, and he's like, John, you can buy real estate and you cannot pay taxes on the gains. I couldn't believe it. You know, I, so I had to go to the IRS website and look at publication 590 and read the tax code and look at different uh, examples and, you know, watch different video training and say, okay, yeah, this, this actually works. It's really no different than buying a stock or mutual fund. When you buy a stock and you sell that stock and you recognize a capital gain, there's no taxes in an IRA. That's the benefit of an IRA. And the same thing works for investing in a property or a private money loan. So another way that a lot of our customers will create wealth is by private money lending. So they'll loan money secured by real estate to investors. Uh, for example, um, I had a client that made a $100,000 loan last year to an investor that did a fix and flip project. It was a single family property, three bedroom, one and a half bath. It was about an eight month transaction. And the investor with his $100,000 investment, private money loan, made about a 9% return. So he made a $9,000 profit back into his self-directed IRA. And so that's what I like to call, Brandon, compounding interest in the absence of taxation. If, if audience, viewers, listeners take anything away from this, I encourage them to take away the, the concept and the principle of compounding interest in the absence of taxation. And a self-directed IRA, Roth IRA, solo 401k, SEP IRA, simple IRA, even an HSA, health savings account or covered education savings account, if you're operating in the right way and investing in the right way, then you have the ability to eliminate that variable of taxation. If you eliminate the variable of taxation, you could effectively increase your return on investment. And if you increase your return on investment, you could potentially get to your retirement goals and your financial goals in a shorter period of time. And that's really the the thesis here and what we try to convey to folks and, and what we compel folks to, to take advantage of is getting to their retirement goals and their financial goals in a shorter period of time by taking control of their retirement accounts, which is exactly what you said, Brandon, at the beginning, taking control and investing in what you know and understand. Yeah. You're paying 25, 30%, whatever that number is every year in taxes off all your gains. I mean, it has a huge impact on how long it takes you to reach, you know, retirement. You know, Jack Vogel wrote a really good book. I think it was like the little red book of common sense investing, talking about the the, the effect that fees have on a portfolio. We're talking about just one and two percent fees, right? That advisors and mutual funds charge you. Not saying those are bad, but just you know, look at the long term effects of a one per two, one or two percent fee. Now, now take a twenty or thirty percent fee in the form of taxes if you're not able to use some of these vehicles. And there's tons of vehicles, like John mentioned. There's there's HSAs, there's uh, SEPAs, there's your Roth IRAs. You know, we're not going to go too far into that, but I encourage everybody to listen and go research the different vehicles that they're out there. And I'm sure uh, John's company, Equity Trust, can can answer even more questions if anybody has those. Now, what are some of the more popular alternative investments? People hear this word alternative investments. What are you seeing clients investing in that are popular alternative assets and then maybe some that are available that people don't know that they can invest in? Yeah, so we we mentioned an example of a single family rental property. That that I think is the, the simplest way to explain how it works and an investment class that our clients have been participating in for a lot of years. We, we've been in business for, we're going on 50 years now. We have over 40 billion in assets under custody and administration. And that's really how we got started is people going out and buying single family rental properties, maybe doing a fix and flip. And then people started getting creative over the years. So for example, one of the challenges that I find a lot of investors will have is they only have a small amount of money in their IRA to get started. And so they're, they're looking at this and they're saying, well, to buy a single family rental property in my market, I would need 
you know, a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars, but I only have twenty, thirty thousand dollars in my IRA, or maybe they even have less than that. Maybe they're starting with a brand new contribution and they can only put six thousand five hundred into the plan. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, what a lot of investors will do is they'll look to partner with other investors. So here's a good example of that, Brandon. I had a client down in Dayton, Ohio. This was uh, last year. He had about thirteen thousand and some change in his Roth IRA. And he had an opportunity to buy a house in Dayton, Ohio, fix it up and sell it. And he needed 75,000 for the purchase and renovations, but he only had 13,000 and some change in his Roth IRA. Mm -hmm. So what he did is he found another investor partner that he met at a local real estate investor group. And this particular investor uh, is also from Dayton, Ohio. So I'm not gonna use their names. I'm just gonna say investor A and investor B. So investor A had 13,000 and some change. Investor B also had a self-directed IRA. It didn't have to be a self-directed IRA, but it so happened he had one. And he had cash in there and it was earning little to no interest. So he was looking for ways to deploy his capital. So it was a perfect bond because you had investor A who had an opportunity, but didn't have enough money. And mm -hmm. investor B who didn't have an opportunity, but had money. So they came together, they partnered, they bought the property, fixed it up, sold it, and they split the profits 50-50. So even though investor A only had 13,000 and some change in the transaction, investor A, because he's the one who found the opportunity, negotiated 50% of the net profits. So they sold the property and at closing, this was about a month ago now, uh, at closing, they, uh, they split the profits 50-50 and investor A made a $34,000 profit. He grew his Roth IRA from 13,000 and some change to over 47,000 and he paid 0% tax all tax because it was in his Roth IRA. So that's the power of a simple real estate joint venture. And Brandon, I know you've been in the real estate game for a long, long time. I'm sure you've, you've seen lots of real estate joint ventures. Uh, it was just simply their IRAs coming together, partnering to buy the property as tenants and common owners. Mm -hmm. They had a joint venture agreement that said 50% goes to investor A, 50% goes to investor B. Investor A grew his Roth IRA tax-free to over $47,000. So now what does he do? He rinse, repeat, reload, reinvest, put it into another transaction in the next year, and then grow that account over time. So that way he has a nice retirement nest egg built up that's all tax-free for his future. Now, his theory is I have a lot of assets outside of my IRA. He's looking to leave that Roth IRA to his children or grandchildren and leave a legacy to them 100% tax-free. So that's another example. Beyond that, Brandon, I mentioned private money lending, mm -hmm. uh, buying notes uh, for anybody out there that buys owner-occupied notes, uh, buying notes, selling partials, trust deeds, mortgage notes, uh, real estate partnerships. You can use your IRA to invest in a syndication type transaction, multifamily, single family, whatever that may be. Um, Aside from real estate, you could also use a self-directed IRA to invest in private companies, uh, equipment leasing. Uh, so, for example, I had a customer that bought a, uh, a Bobcat, um, you know, skid steer and le lease leasing it out to contractors. Um, so you can get really creative in using an IRA. There's only a few limitations as far as what you can't do with the IRA. Mm -hmm. The government is exclusive rather than being inclusive. They tell us what we can't invest in, not what we can invest in. We have customers that also invest in private equity funds, hedge funds, venture capital funds, venture debt, um, using online crowdfunding or investment funding platforms. You can use your IRA and often invest into those types of opportunities. Uh, equity Trust actually has a resource as a customer called WealthBridge, which is an online gateway to private asset investment platforms. Uh, and then we also have something called investmentdistrict.com which allows customers to introduce themselves to various investment opportunities. We don't endorse or recommend investment opportunities, but we do provide sort of the menu for people to be able to browse and do due diligence on. And uh, outside of that, last but not least, Brandon, uh, for anybody that's interested in hard assets uh, being gold and silver, platinum, mm -hmm. palladium, uh, you can use your IRA under Section 408M. There's certain exemptions to the collectible rule that allows investors to invest in gold and silver, physical gold and silver, and then store that at a depository. And then, of course, everybody always asks me, can you invest in cryptocurrency with an IRA? You actually can. 
And we have a crypto trading platform that's fully integrated that allows investors to be able to seamlessly use their self-directed IRA funds in a tax-free capacity mm -hmm. to trade in the crypto markets. So tons of different asset classes there. If the listeners wanted to go anywhere in particular to learn more about what they can and can't invest in, do you have any resources you'd be able to send them to? Yeah, absolutely. Um, our website has a lot of this information, trustetc.com. Um, also, folks can go visit our YouTube page. I always like to plug that. Uh, there's a lot of good information and education, video content on there. Just search Equity Trust Company on YouTube. Um, you know, our YouTube page you'll find is very much like your podcast, Brandon. Lots of good, hearty education and information. There's no hype. We're, uh, we're a regulated financial institution, so we're very disciplined in our approach in terms of how we educate the public. Mm -hmm. What are some of the pitfalls that you see newer investors who are you know, wanting to use this self-directed IRA platform make? Uh, so the first pitfall that investors will make is their intentions are to engage in what we call a prohibited transaction. So with IRAs, 401ks, HSA, CISA accounts, the IRS, the government, if you will, the tax code does define transactions that are disallowed. So, for example, if you own a property now personally, you can't sell it to your IRA. Uh, if you do fix and flips, you can't use your IRA money and loan it to yourself personally. You can't loan money to your spouse. You can't loan money to your kids or your parents. Mm -hmm. So the tax code defines what are called disqualified persons to your IRA, and then they define what transactions are. So disqualified persons would be yourself your spouse, your children, your parents, your grandparents, your grandchildren. So anyone up and down the family tree essentially mm -hmm. is a disqualified person to you and your businesses that you own and operate are disqualified persons. And you can't transact with those, those persons. So you can't buy from, sell from, lease from, lend money, provide mm -hmm. services. You can't receive any type of personal benefit. I can't buy a vacation rental and stay there even for one or two days. That would be a what's called prohibited transaction mm -hmm. and my IRA would be distributed. So it's not that a lot of people engage in these transactions because we do provide education and information. We can't advise them, but we can provide education. But some people will go into this opening an account thinking that they could do something that they can't do. You know, So for example, I had a, someone that wanted to use an IRA to buy a, um, a, an apartment in a co-op and then they wanted to live there. Well, you can't do that. And it sort of defeats the spirit of the IRA anyways, because if you think about it, these IRAs, like we've been talking about, have super high, powerful tax benefits. And you want to use those tax benefits to your advantage. And you want to invest in assets that are generating good cash flow and appreciation. So mm -hmm. that way you can take advantage of those tax benefits. But Brandon, I will say, and I won't go too far into this, but I will say that Americans, in my experience, for whatever reason, have been conditioned to raid their retirement plans when the going gets tough. And that is completely opposite of the way we should be thinking. We should be thinking, how can we maximize contributions to our IRAs? How do we keep as much money in there as possible? Because there's so much horsepower behind those accounts from a tax-free perspective. Mm -hmm. But unfortunately, society has just sort of per perpetrated this raid your IRA when the going gets tough. IRAs can avoid probate. IRAs can avoid uh, creditors. So there's certain creditor protections involved. IRAs are, are super powerful from a sheltering perspective. And so I can't speak um, you know, more confidently with respect to you know, capturing as much money as you can in your IRAs and, and really growing those accounts. Um, so those are, those are really the pitfalls uh, that I see folks uh, run into. And then aside from that, um, you can't use your IRA to invest in collectibles like artwork, for example. You can't use your IRA to invest in uh, alcoholic beverages. And then lastly, it is important to know, Brandon, that if your IRA is invested in a debt leverage real estate transaction, there is a special tax known as unrelated business income tax. It's not something people should be fearful of. It's just something they should be aware of that can be triggered when their IRA is involved in a debt leverage transaction. And that is, I don't know if I'd call it a pitfall, but it's just one of those things that a lot of people aren't aware of when they're planning their investment trajectory. Mm -hmm. So I encourage folks just to do their due diligence and know what they're investing in. 
and and some of the um, the facets of that investment so that they can pencil it out and make sure that it's a prudent investment for themselves. Now, when you say debt leverage, is that like investing as an equity partner in a syndication fund? What 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 is a, a debt leverage investment for those that have not heard that? Yeah, debt leverage would be as an example. Let's say I bought a property with my IRA account for a hundred thousand, and I borrowed fifty thousand. And you do have to get a special type of loan. It's called a non recourse loan in the industry, which basically means the account owner is not signing a personal guarantee. Because with IRAs, an account owner that borrows money using their IRA uh, cannot sign a personal guarantee. Right. And so it's a special type of loan. But let's use the example of a hundred thousand dollar purchase, fifty thousand dollar loan. So 50% of that property is debt financed. And what's going to happen is 50% of the net profit is going to become subject to what's called unrelated business income tax. And in some circles, you'll hear this referred to as unrelated debt financed income tax. Now, that's going to be based on the net. So after all your operating expenses and your depreciation, you would then come up with your net figure. In some cases, there's enough depreciation and operating expenses to totally wipe out any net income that would be subject to this unrelated debt financed income tax. So that's the example of an IRA owned a property directly with debt financing. If an IRA invested in an LLC syndication structure, and let's assume that the IRA is in fact a limited partner, equity partner, and they're getting a K-1 is usually mm -hmm. what you'll hear that referred to as. In that instance, if the property has debt financing on it, which it probably does, the IRA would have exposure to unrelated debt financed income tax. It doesn't mean that it's a deal breaker. A lot of people use their IRAs to invest in those types of opportunities. It's just something you have to understand. There might be a little bit of a tax there. Mm -hmm. And then you want to look at, okay, what is that tax in relation to the overall return on investment? And is that better than other investments that I can make elsewhere? And some people come to the conclusion that, I would be, it would be prudent for me to make that investment. We can't tell you that at Equity Trust, but uh, ultimately you would pencil that out on your own and determine if that makes the most sense for you. Or some folks prefer to invest in like a REIT structure, mm -hmm. like a private real estate investment trust structure, or they might invest in like mezzanine financing funds where it's interest income instead of the um, typical K-1 income. And then the interest income flows back into their IRA and uh, should be exempt from unrelated business income tax. For those who are listening, who might be a little overwhelmed at all the rules and the regulations and the pitfalls, and mean like, you know, I don't want to do anything that's illegal or wrong. You know, what would you advise them to do if they are, you know, reaching out to your company, Equity Trust, or you know, another self-directed custodian company? Do you all act in an advisory sense or have that kind of service where, you know, you can kind of help advise and prevent some of these pitfalls or do they just have to go and start, you know, researching all this? Cause it's a lot. Yeah. So there's as a directed custodian, uh, and this goes for any self-directed IRA company in the industry. Uh, we, we don't advise uh, or recommend, but what we do do is we have a lot of education and a lot of information. And um, at first glance, for someone that's brand new, it can seem overwhelming because you're going to have all this information thrown at you online about, you know, do this, don't do this, uh, don't do that, you know, type of thing. And, you know, sometimes the individuals that are that are presenting this have a biased approach. Uh, maybe they're selling a specific investment opportunity. So they're say, they're going to slant some of their commentary in a certain way. The best thing to do is if you're brand new to start educating yourself on, okay, what is a self-directed IRA? What types of investments can I make? And then, of course, most, most importantly, what is your skill set now as an investor? Or what are you learning about or tra getting training on to invest in? Because a lot of people that are already investing in real estate, for the most part, they can take exactly what their strategy is now and do it in a self-directed IRA. Now, in some cases, they have to tweak things here and there in order to make it work for their self-directed IRA. But relatively speaking, most people that already have a strategy that's working for them, they can just say, okay, I'm going to do that same strategy using my self-directed IRA. And maybe it doesn't mean you're doing every deal, but maybe you do one or two deals a year in that IRA to start building up that IRA. And then you can add in maybe a spouse's IRA or a child's IRA or a CESA or an HSA, and you can just build things over time. 
And so that's what I encourage folks to do is, you know, look at their current situation or what they're getting training on now and how to do that with an IRA and take advantage of the resources that self-directed IRA companies have. For example, we have a YouTube channel and people could go on our, on our YouTube channel and that should get them about 60% of the way there. And then from there, they can reach out to Equity Trust directly and they can speak with one of our IRA counselors. We can't give you advice, but we can educate you on the process and how that works. And then from there, you know, you fold in maybe your real estate attorney, maybe your CPA or tax preparer and kind of help you get over the finish line with how you're going to structure these investments. Plenty of people want to do very simple transactions like buy a rental property or invest in a promissory note, a private money loan or buy a trust deed or mortgage note. You know, those types of transactions are pretty straightforward. If you're somebody that wants to get more creative and invest in a partnership type arrangement, syndication, uh, joint venture, like I mentioned before, you know, that's where you're then going to take it to the next level and start working with the people that can help counsel you on those matters. Now, for those that are interested in this, and let's say they reach out to their financial advisor and that are like, hey, you know, I heard on the show, the self-directed, I'd like to convert a portion of my funds into the self-directed, and they're getting some pushback from the financial advisor. What are some of the reasons why maybe they get some pushback and what you know, talk tracks would you advise them to have with their financial advisor when looking at this? So the, the first is always that financial advisor may be incentivized to not be welcoming to self-directed IRAs and investing in real estate or other alternative assets. They could potentially say that it's not diversification, that they have better options. Um, that's where you know I encourage folks to um, you know, take a, a stand. Uh, if you believe that alternative investing in real estate or other alternatives makes sense for you, then you need to have that, that bold conversation with your financial advisor. Now, if you're not somebody that wants that, you know, maybe you just want to stay in the stock market and bonds and uh, fixed income and traditional investments. If that's your, if that's your path, if you want to be involved in managing your money, then you're going to need to just stay that course. I, I, I really don't have any information to provide to somebody that doesn't want to be involved in managing their own money. What I will say very transparently and bluntly is a lot of folks that have come to me, come to our training, come to our company, is because the, the reason why they're not doing as well as they are in their retirement portfolio is because they are not involved in managing their own money. <laughs> if they want to take a stand and be involved in managing their own money. And so managing your own money requires this whole concept of, of self-directed. And so having that bold conversation with your financial advisor, and, and maybe you still retain them for a percentage of your portfolio, and then mm -hmm. you move over just a portion to equity trust for your self-directed investments. We have plenty of folks that just use us for a portion of their IRA custody. Mm -hmm. That the part that they want to invest in alternatives because their current financial institution won't allow them to do that is to answer the second part of your question, Brandon, as far as resources are concerned, we actually have a video on YouTube that addresses and you can send to your financial advisor or CPA. It actually says send to your CPA or financial advisor. So it's really easy to find. And that will educate them a little bit more on self-directed IRAs and how it works. I will say that some advisors are are very open to uh, self direction. They understand diversification. They appreciate it, mm -hmm. and uh, they're more than happy to let a client know, "Hey, if you want to move a portion out, we're happy to do that. I'll sell the stock that's in there now, or mutual funds, or whatever it is, and you can move it out to Equity Trust because they understand that they're probably still going to retain some of your business mm -hmm. if they cooperate with you in what you want to do and what your intentions are." Yeah, it all just depends on what your overall goals are. But if you know if that advisor is heavily against it, then and you're moving money from out of their pocket essentially to you know, your own, then yeah, they could potentially have an issue with that. But they should be on board with it because it is a fantastic vehicle to diversify and give you that long-term diversification that you need to ultimately protect your portfolio. If listeners want to learn, you know, more about you, your company. Uh, maybe even schedule an introductory call, you know, how do they reach out? Yeah. So the best way to connect with us is uh, going to our website, trustetc.com. Um, folks can call in directly and talk to an IRA counselor Monday through Friday. Uh, they're welcome to do that. 
Uh, they'll also find on our website, they can fill out a form and they can request a consultation. Then we'll call you directly. You can set up a specific date and time. Um, and then if folks just want to get educated before they reach out to us, they can go to our YouTube channel, uh, Search Equity Trust, and we have all kinds of video content on there. Yep, I've seen it. Equity Trust YouTube channel. It's fantastic. Go check that out. John, it's been a pleasure having you. Thanks for hopping on and joining us today. Thank you, Brandon. All right, see ya.